So tonight we're, we're getting into Genesis, which is one of my favorite books. I've read Genesis more than any book of the Bible. And Genesis 1.1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And so after I read that first verse, I just, I've, I've always wondered, there's, this, uh, there's these two different types of beliefs, right? There's old earth, and then there's new earth. So I want to ask you a question tonight and ask you in your, in your belief system and what you believe and what you've learned and what you've studied in the Word of God, are you an old earth creationist or are you new earth creationist? Or do you even know what it means? So old earth is uh, crea creationist. They don't believe in a literal six day creation. Right? A lot of what they believe falls in line with Darwinian um, evolution. They, don't, they believe that the creation happened over a period of thousands, hundreds, and millions of years. Right? And so they don't believe that in a literal six day creation, but they also don't believe that Noah's Ark literally happened. They believe it was symbolic, just like creation was symbolic. They also believe that the Tower of Babel was symbolic. They don't believe it literally happened. So a lot of old earth creationists, although they believe in, in, in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they don't believe in a literal six-day translation because they want to take 2 Peter 3.8 where it says, "Be not, uh, are you blind? A day unto the Lord is a thousand, a thousand unto the Lord. So they want to say that it took each day a thousand, each day of creation was a thousand years. There, that would put it at 7,000, because if you rest it on 7,000, but as you know, new earth creationists, we believe the earth is barely 6,000 years old. Right? So we don't believe, I don't, as a new earth creation, I believe in a literal six day creation. But the old earth likes to take that verse and twist it to fit their narrative. Yeah. And it's okay if if you believe that, I guess, but the problem when you start believing in old earth creationism and that everything is symbolic, it takes away from so many truths in Genesis, Exodus, and Leviticus. All the stories, it takes away from the truths of what we believe. There's so many new, newness, there's so much beginning that happened right here in Genesis chapter 1. Um, and again, they like to tie that into 2 Peter 3.8. But for us, there's a great deal of difference as humans, right? There's a di big deal of difference between me one day and a thousand years in my, in my mind. It's a big difference. But to God, who has all authority, who's Alpha and Omega, is no difference, right? Because He is God of past, present, and future. They are all before Him every single day. So a thousand years to him is nothing. So that verse in 2 Peter 3.8 has no relevance on creation because God is specific. And when you go back to the Hebrew, and I don't understand Hebrew much, but I do study it, and, and you understand that it was a literal day. There was an evening and the morning because our days start in the evening, not when we wake up. So the evening and the morning was the first day. The evening and the morning was the second day. New Earth creationists, as myself, believe in a literal six-day creation with the day of rest. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And to get into a little bit of science on this, when I was doing some research, research, I, uh, I come across this idea, and it's called a continuum. How you doing, sir? It's called a continuum. Does anybody know what a continuum is? It's a scientific term. I had to look it up. I had to Google it. Um, and I searched many, many different places. <laughs> what is, is that the door? Yeah, yeah. Nice. So I looked it up and I was wondering, what, there's got to be so much more here in Genesis. So a continuum, who knows what a continuum is? So a continuum is when everything comes into place, boom, at one time, right? The evolutionists like to call it the Big Bang, right? It had happened like 4.5 billion years ago. And just for a little side note, uh, even scientists now are saying after 60,000 years of carbon dating, you can't tell anyways. But they're even pushing it to 60,000. I don't even know where they come up with that number. 
Anything after 60,000 could be a billion, it could even be a trillion. Nobody can prove it. Nobody can literally scientifically prove anything past Adam and Eve. So, anyways, but a continuum is when all things come together at once. So, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Beginning equals time. Heavens equals space. Earth equals matter. Time, space, and matter. They all came into existence at exactly the same time. When God created the heavens and the earth, everything came into existence. Time, space, and matter. Because if He created space first, what would He put in it? If He created matter, where would He put it if He didn't have space? If He created time, well, how would we measure it if He didn't have matter you follow me? So it all came into existence at the same time. So that's what we call a trinity. Last week we talked about the trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But that's also a trinity right here in Genesis chapter 1. Beginning, heavens, and earth. Time, space, and matter. Now within those three time, space, and matter, you have also three more trinities. Time equals past, present, and future. Space equals length, width, and height, and matter equals solid, liquid, and gas. I would think that the God that we serve kind of knew a little bit about what He was doing. What do you think? I think He knows a little bit something. So in Hebrew, it, when you read from right to left, it says, In the beginning created God, the heaven, and the earth. That's seven words, right? So what does the number of seven mean? In Scripture, symbolic. Completeness. Completeness, right? It means whole. It means uh, perfection. It means fullness. It means abundance. It means rest, completion. So when God said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, it was complete. It was done. It was whole. Where else do we see that same pattern of completeness? Jesus at the cross. And how many statements did Jesus say make when He was on the cross? Give you a hint. There are seven. Can you name them? Now, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are synop synoptic Gospels. They all talk about the same thing. John talks about something different. John picks up the first two years of Jesus' life. Matthew, Mark, and Luke start their Gospels at the death of John the Baptist when he is beheaded. So, we have so many different stories there. So, how many can y'all name what Jesus said on the cross? Yes. It is finished. Okay. Father, forgive them for the they That's two. Today you shall enter the paradise of the Son of Man. That's three. Let's give them for what they have done. That's four. No, she already said them. So, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Luke chapter 23. Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. When he was talking to the thief on the cross, which there's a whole sermon there about theology and baptism and salvation right there with Jesus and the thief on the cross. Woman, behold your son. Who did he say that to? Yes, he said that to John, the beloved, right? John is the one that wrote first and second John. He wrote the Gospel of John and he wrote Revelation. He was he was, uh, what he was saying was, what Jesus was saying to John was, she's now your, your mother. You're going to take care of her. And mom, now he's your son. You're going to take care of him. He left his responsibility of his mother to John. And then he says, number four, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Eloi, Eloi, lama shabachthani. Matthew chapter 27. Then he says, I thirst. Remember, they wanted to give him sour wine. Then he says in number six, it says, it is finished. And then number seven, he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Complete. It was whole. Everything Jesus did on the cross echoed through eternity past. Right here in the garden where we're going to get into talking to Adam and Eve with the very first sacrifice. When Adam and Eve sinned and God came to them and said, where are you? walking with them in the cool of the day and they hid because they were afraid and I don't want to get into that yet because there's so much I want to unpack there oh, just move on to move on so Genesis starts with in the beginning so what existed or happened before the beginning who can tell me what existed or happened before the beginning we we. 
Anything. Okay. So, God was before the beginning. Psalms 93, 2. The Trinity of God was before the beginning. God had a specific plan for humans before the beginning. Look, I want us to remember and keep in, in, uh, keep in our mindset that God created time for us. He, didn't, he wasn't bound by time. Time started, our knowledge of time started when God created the heavens and earth. That's not when God's time started. When did God's time start? God doesn't. He says He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning of the end. There is no, he's the first and the last. There's no beginning or no end, nor will there ever be. So He created time, a starting place for us. He created the angels in Job 38. Satan fell from heaven in Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah chapter 14. So in the beginning, God, and in case you didn't know this about what the statement is saying, is it is uh, God, God isn't asking your permission if he can be God when it says in Genesis 1 that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. He wasn't asking your permission. He wasn't saying, oh, I think I might be a God, or he wasn't saying, I hope to be a God. He was making a declaration. I am God. There is no gods before me, and there will be no gods after me. It's a declaration. It was a statement. He was declaring his sovereignty. He was declaring his lordship. And your opinion, whether or not he is God, is irrelevant to the fact that he is God. Just because people say there is no God doesn't mean there is no God. All right? The Bible is clear. There is a God. So, before time was, God was. Before space was, God was. Before matter was, God was. He was there from the beginning. So, who wrote Genesis? Other than the Holy Spirit, we know it was inspired by the Holy Spirit. Who wrote Genesis? Moses. How many books did Moses write? Five. How did Moses know about creation? There's some theories out here. I'm just going to throw them out there. I believe he was inspired by the Holy Spirit. But we, but we don't know, 100%, absolute, that that is how he wrote them. How do we know that Adam and Eve didn't take the account of creation pass it on to Cain and Abel, then pass it on to Seth, and then pass it on through Methuselah and on down through the generations, and just like they did in history, right? When the Jews memorized all the... Right? Well, the flood I didn't destroy everything. It's a world tradition, so it wouldn't happen. The eight people was on the ark. Right? The straight descendants of Adam and Eve... Well, if it's an oral, you're speaking of the Talmud. Talmud is an oral tradition. It's not. It's a written. But they had to memorize it in order to become into manhood. So it was also verbal. You know what I'm saying? So is that how they knew it? Or was it the Holy Spirit? Or maybe it was both. Does it matter? Does it matter to our salvation? If Adam and Eve passed that information on, or if the Holy Spirit told them, no, it absolutely does not. But it's interesting when you think about it. But I do believe in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. So somewhere along the way, Moses was inspired to write Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. He was the only man I know of that wrote about his death. <laughs> Beside Jesus. And he didn't really write. He just talked about it. But Moses wrote about how he was going to die. And he went up on Nebo, saw the promised land, and then he died. In the beginning, God created, he formed, he fashioned the heavens and the earth. This is God's first revelation to mankind. God's name here is Elohim, meaning strong one. The Bible makes no attempt just so we're all on the same page. The Bible makes no attempt to prove there is a God. There's no explanation of Genesis 1, of trying to explain to us where God came from, who He is, what He's doing, and what His plans are. It's just saying there is a God, and it makes no attempt to prove it. It doesn't argue His existence, but rather it declares it. God existed before the beginning and before all creation. The word for create used here means to bring into being without the use of pre-existing material. And I'm going to say something, and I'm sure you've probably heard it. There was a, a, a scientist 
most brilliant scientist ever in the world. He went to God one day and he said, hey, we don't need you no more. We don't need you no more because we have figured out how to make mankind. We have figured out how to create life. And God said, okay, well, what do you want to do? He said, let's have a, a challenge. Let's, ha let's have a competition to see who can create something out of nothing. And, it, and God said, okay, let's do this. And the scientist reached down to get a bucket of dirt, and God said, oh, no, get your own dirt. <laughs> see, God created everything. When he says he owns the cattle on a thousand hills, let us not forget he also owns the hills mm -hmm. that the cattle are grazing on. Mm -hmm. Amen. There's a difference in seeking knowledge and seeking godly truth. Yeah. And, and um, coming from a theological background in my education, I saw a lot of that type of dynamic with professors. Mm -hmm. And often people that were seeking knowledge were blinded and unable to see godly truth. Mm -hmm. and That's so, what the Bible says. It says ever seeking knowledge yes. and never coming to yes. the knowledge of the truth of Jesus Christ. They'll be ever seeking and never coming to the truth. God, isn't that what the so, tree that we ate from? Or the... I don't know much about this stuff. Yes, we're going to get into the tree in a couple weeks. The tree of knowledge? Yes, okay. the tree of knowledge okay. of good and evil. And there's also the tree of life. Um, so I said all of that originally. I said all of that to let me make a bold statement. That if you cannot accept the first verse, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, you cannot accept the remainder of the Scripture. Because everything from Genesis 1 is a reflection of God's creation. Right. From the heaven, the earth, the stars, the galaxies, the moon, humans, everything is a reflection. It is, comes from the very first verse. So if you cannot accept the first verse as scripture, then you cannot accept the rest of it. So before we continue, is there anyone that does not accept Genesis 1-1? That's truth. So the first verse is the doorway to the Word of God. People who think they can explain creation apart from the Scripture do well to consider the statement made by the Lord to Job when He said in Job 38, 4, Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if you have understanding, is what God is telling Job. The creation account must be accepted by faith. Right? Why is it accepted by faith? Because we weren't there. We just weren't there. And there's going to be things that happen that we don't understand and that we don't know about. But it, we take it by faith. This is what God said and this is what we believe. We accept it. Through and through. Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. Um, so evolution. Let's, let's talk on that for a second. Darwin's theory, the belief that the world and mankind evolved from simple to complex forms without divine participation is speculation. To accept it, you must also believe that by faith. Why? Because none of us was there five and a half billion years ago when a little piece of matter landed on the rock and the rock got near a pond and the, it, then life started with inorganic molecules that became matter and then through natural transformation and selective uh, process became organic molecules. So according to evolution, we started as photocells and then we became multicellular life. Then we became fish and tadpoles, then mammals, then we became apes and then on to become homo sapiens. Well, I have a problem with all that. <laughs> and it doesn't take a scientist to understand either. But number one, where did the matter come from? Where did the matter come from? Where is the evidence of one species becoming another? Right? Throughout history, we have fossils of thousands and thousands of apes. We have fossils of thousands and thousands of humans, but we have no one fossil of an ape transitioning, evolving into a human being. And if so, if evolution was the truth, guys, why have we not continued to evolve? Why are we still where we're at? Because as far back as we could trace, we have evidence of humans. We have evidence of, hum of apes. <clears throat> In the 1940s, there was a, a, 
an archaeologist who was being funded, and they told him, basically, if you don't find something soon, we're cutting your funding. So this one, this whole idea of Lucy came along. Y'all remember Lucy? Mm -hmm. Right? Well, when you do the research and you figure out that the hip bone they found and the toe bone they found was a year and a half apart and seven miles apart, they've already determined the toe bone was a pig. But he got another five years of funding. So they created this myth and called it Lucy. The bridge, the gap, proof, evidence. Why was there only one? We've been digging for centuries, right? We have not found one shred of evidence. And lastly, again, why are we not still evolving? Why, if we have evolved from apes, why do we still have apes? If we have evolved from tadpoles to frogs, why do we still have frogs and tadpoles? I mean, God sent the frogs to Egypt. Yeah. He didn't send humans. <laughs> he sent frogs. I can tell you why. I can tell you why. Because God said He created the heavens and the earth. Day one, He created time, light, heavens and earth. Day two, He created skies and seas. Day three, land and plants. Day four, the sun, the moon, and the stars and the planets. Day five, fish and birds. Day six, land animals and man. And day seven, He rested. And on day four, where it says He created the sun, the moon, the stars, and the planets. See, science has it backwards. Science has us trying to believe in our textbooks over the last 40 years that the galaxies came together and formed the planet Earth. That's not the truth. The truth is the sun, the moon, the stars, and the planets came from Earth and out. That's how God designed it. That's how God created it. Science has it backwards. God has it right from the beginning. Did you have something, Dad? So those who embrace, embrace evolution have never been able to answer the question of how nothing becomes something. How nothing becomes something. Their theory always starts with something. They claim matter became a living being. They believe that there was a process of evolving from one species to another. Not one example. So in the beginning occurs 51 times in the Old Testament and always indicates the launching of a series of events. One of the other places that in the beginning uh, is mentioned is in John. John 1.1. 1, 1, right? So Genesis 1 says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. John 1 says, in the beginning there was God. And in the beginning was God. There was, and the Word was with God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. In the beginning was God. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. Let me slow down. <laughs> right? <laughs> in the beginning. There's a lot of stuff that happens in the beginning. Everything. When God, when, when people ask me about the Big Bang, I say, you know, I believe there was probably a Big Bang, but not in the sense that you believe it. I can only imagine if there was this void of nothing, and then the Almighty Creator, God, spoke into existence everything. There had to be something. There had to be some cataclysmic crackling and bursting and, and things change. And that was the, ev the first evidence that there's power in our words. That there's life and death in the power of our tongue is when God spoke into existence the earth that we live on, the atmosphere that we live in. Then if you want to dig deeper a little bit into science and get into what people are calling this whole flat earth, <laughs> how can you? I'm not even going to cover that, but how can you believe in the flat earth? There's so much evidence that says there's not. And God created everything with us in mind. <laughs> it all came into existence with a plan and a purpose. Every hair in our head. Isn't that amazing? Though? That He had so much love and 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 thought about it so much that he created this, right? And he's so, he's so powerful. And let me tell you something about God's creation. And you may have never thought about it like this, but everything in God's creation from everything, the plants, the animals, the birds, the seas, the mountains, the skies, the wind, everything God created does exactly what God created it to do, except what? Us. 
Why is that? Because we have free will. The wind doesn't have free will. It goes where the Lord tells it to go. The seas stop where God tells it to stop. The flowers grow where God tells it to grow. But we have free will. And we can do what we want. We can say what we want. We can get upset. We can get mad. We can argue. We can fight. We can do right. We can do good. And when we get to the tree of knowledge of good and evil, everybody focuses on the, on the bad that came out of the knowledge of good and evil. But what about the good part? What about the good part of the tree that we don't talk about? I can't wait for next week. <laughs> we're going to get to it. So we're going we're gonna to go ahead and end right here. Um, say one thing there about like, God and, and He loved us so much that in the very first verse of His Word, He starts to give us insight into His character. Mm -hmm. One of His attributes, He was created. Yeah. Why did He create? Yeah. Solely for the purpose that He could fellowship with us. Yes. I mean, when you think about that, that is pretty heavy. Yeah.